The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, Today we're going to talk about the profiling tools available on Cell to help you evaluate how your programs are running. And uh, next hour I'll talk about SIMD, which is how you can take advantage of uh, the hardware support for data parallelization. Uh, first up, I'd like to follow up with some questions that we had last time about GDB. And then I'll discuss some of the various methods for profiling on Cell. I'll talk about the Cell simulator and using the decrementers and then we're going to talk about uh, static profiling and re instruction reordering, which I started to get into last time. Uh, so first up, uh, we ran into some problems last time with GDB, various error messages. Uh, first thing, sometimes GDB is going to examine the wrong variable, as we saw when the names are ambiguous. Uh, one thing you can do to get around this, uh, we had problems with ambiguity between uh, variables which had the same name where one of them was in the SPU thread and one of them was in the PPU thread. And so to work around this, one thing you can do is use SPU GDB, which will just lock on to a particular SPU thread. Then you can just uh, look for then you can just look for variable names in that thread. Uh, you can also of course rename your variables. Uh, second problem is that sometimes GDB will delete your breakpoints before you want it to delete them. Uh, reason being it will remove breakpoints when, whenever the program associated with a breakpoint has been unloaded. But sometimes you have more than one thread running on, uh, more than one thread running the same program. And so the uh, second one you won't be able to break into. Uh, so again, you can use SPUGDB to lock onto a particular thread if you want to, if you want to do that. Uh, another thing you can do is a kind of, for example, put a delay loop at the end of your SPU thread in order to keep that thread running for as long as possible. It seems that as long as GDB doesn't unload that thread, then it won't delete your breakpoint. And finally, some of, uh, I saw this kind of cryptic error, thread event breakpoint GDB should not stop. Yeah, indeed it shouldn't. Um, one thing uh, to get around this, it seems that this problem doesn't happen on SPU GDB. So I'll just recap how to use SPU GDB to, de to debug your programs. Uh, last time we were using mostly PPU GDB, which will help you debug kind of both your PPU program and your SPU program together. And you're able to switch between all the threads that are available. On the other hand, when you're using SPU GDB, it's just going to lock on to a particular SPU thread. So what you do is you invoke your uh, original PPU program with SPU debug start equals one, and then you can uh, background it. Now what happens is, Every time that your every time that your SPU sorry or every time that your program spawns a new SPU thread, it will print the process ID and then actually that thread the spawn thread will stop and wait for a debugger to attach to it. So at this point you can run SPU GDB dash P and then the process number that they give you, and when you attach to it you can continue that thread to resume debugging. <coughs> All right, any questions? OK. So the cell simulator, <coughs> excuse me. The cell simulator is one of the tools that we have available uh, to help you debug. Uh, this is how you invoke it if you have it installed, opt IBM system sim cell bin system sim. And you want to use dash G to use the graphical interface. And a little window will pop up, and you'll click Go. Uh, the window looks like this. It actually, from here, you can have a lot of fine grained control over how your program is running. In fact, you can, advance your, uh, you can advance the state of the simulation cycle by cycle to look at what's going on inside the simulated cell system. And uh, when you boot up this uh, simulator, you can actually get a complete Linux environment in there uh, with an X term. And what you can do in this Linux environment is you can copy over programs, and then you can, you can copy over programs which were compiled for the cell, and then you can run them. Uh, in order to transfer a program to your simulated system so that you can run it, uh, you, can use this, uh, you can use this function, or you can use this program call through, 
which is available on the simulated system. And what it will do is it will uh, grab onto a file which is on the host system and copy it in. And it will just, uh, it will just uh, put it on standard out so you can uh, redirect it to whatever file you want. And then when you make it executable, then you can run it. All right, questions? Uh, while you're in the simulator, you can, you can uh, view a lot of different things. You can get a lot of, of information about the state of the machine. Uh, in particular, you can you know, look at the registers at any particular time, again, with you know, clock step by clock step. Uh, this might not be as interesting now that you have the debugger and you can run the debugger on real hardware. Uh, but one thing which the, uh, which the cell simulator does get you is uh, these dynamic profiling tools. And what it will do is uh, it will you know, look at the state of the simulation and we'll figure out you know, where things are stalling, kind of where the time is being spent by the processor. And you can get separate stats like these. Uh, let's see, it tells you, for example, total cycle count, stalls for various reasons. You can get all these statistics se separately for the PPU and each SPU. So this, this can be very helpful if you're trying to do, for example, you know, you're trying to figure out exactly what's going on on each <coughs> SPU, do load balancing, whatever. All right? And so that's, and so these statistics will hold these statistics will cover you know, whatever length of the program you run. But you can also get more fine-grained statistics using these uh, profiling functions. So if you include profile.h in your program, <laughs> then you get access to these functions, uh, profile clear, start, and stop. And what these will do is uh, they're actually, uh, when they get compiled into your program, there are no ops when you run them on a real cell processor. But the simulator will be able to latch onto them, and uh, you can use those to start and stop regions of interest for, for uh, profiling. All right? Now, uh, the simulator comes with the SDK, and it's a little bit cumbersome to install, so we haven't, uh, we haven't made it available yet on the actual PS3 hardware. Uh, you can run it on x86, and so if your group would like to get set up with that on, on one of your computers, or we'll try and make it available on our hardware if there's enough interest, so please let us know. All right? Okay. Um, the next thing we'll cover is uh, using decrementers to profile your program. Uh, this is one way of one way you can use dynamic profiling, which actually doesn't require the simulator. So uh, when you when you get information from the decrementers, you can run these programs on on your actual cell hardware. Uh, basically, the decrementer is just a counter that counts down at a constant rate. So you can use it as a clock to figure out how long uh, different events are lasting. And the, the rate at which the decrementer counts down uh, is not that fast. So you're not going to be able to use it to time things on the order of you know, a few clock cycles. Uh, it's, best for, it's best for timing things which are maybe you know, on the order of thousands of instructions in length. And how you use it is uh, there are these SPU write channel and SPU read channel functions, which give you access to some of the internals of the cell processor. And, and uh, so here's an example setup you can use. Basically, first you call write channel, and you pass in the, uh, this you know, MFC decrementer event thing. And what that will do is kind of initialize this uh, decrementer counter for you. And, and then you read the value before and after the function you want to profile. And when you subtract, uh, that, just gives you, that just gives you the length or the time that was elapsed in some arbitrary units. And of course, it's counting down, so you want to subtract the start from the end. And after you're done using it, you can uh, you can uh, do another write channel to kind of stop the counter from continuing. All right, any questions? OK. Uh, let's, let's continue talking about re instruction reordering, which I started last time. So I'm going to kind of start from the beginning this time, and maybe it'll be more coherent. So. On the cell architecture, when you're looking at 
you know, what instructions are being run, the instructions are, are mostly going to be of the form, you know, evaluate some function of some of the registers and write the result to some other register. And the assembly file, or what you get when you run with GCC-S, is just going to be you know, a human readable representation of these instructions. And I'll show you how to read that actually later. Uh, and you can think of these instructions just as you know, executing in series, just in the order in which they appear in the assembly. So if you think of you know, one instruction starting and then finishing, the next instruction comes in, finishes, uh, that should be you know, consistent with the actual behavior of the hardware. Now, for real hardware, waiting for one instruction to finish before the next one starts is going to be too slow. So there are these various optimizations we pull or that they do on the hardware in order to uh, run instructions sooner than when the previous instruction finishes. So the big one of these is pipelining where you have multiple stages inside your processor and you can run each instruction, you can push e each instruction in before the previous one has completed. And, uh, and pipelining, you're going to be subject to these dependencies between instructions. For example, if one instruction uh, reads from a value that the previous, previous instruction wrote, then clearly you can't start the second instruction until after the first instruction has completed. Uh, the cell processor also has, actually has multiple pipelines in which you can insert instructions. And another optimization that they do is uh, branch prediction in order to, uh, in order to reduce stalls from, from branching. Now, pardon? Uh, yes. So static branch prediction means, or rather the way it's done on the cell is that uh, uh, what's predicted for the branch is not going to be affected by the uh, by the history of which branches have been taken, which and some other processor ac actually do uh, use this information. <coughs> All right. Now, now the thing about pipelining is that because we still have to honor these dependencies between instructions, the order in which we evaluate instructions that's going to make a difference on how long the program runs. So let's take the simple example where we have three instructions, A, B, and C, and we have this pipeline processor where we can insert instructions at these clock ticks. So suppose that C depends on B and there are no other depend dependencies in the system, then this, uh, then this sequence of instructions is going to take uh, five cycles because we can push B in after the first cycle, but we can't push C in until two cycles after that. Is that clear? Questions? All right. Now, because C depends on B, it kind of makes sense to push B as far up as we can in order to kind of ease this dependency. So if we execute B before A instead of after A, and remember, we can reorder B and A however we want because there's no dependencies between them, then we can start B at the first tick, then we put in A right after that, and then C. And now the sequence only takes four clock cycles. All right? So observe that when we put in C in this third clock cycle, uh, we actually couldn't have put in the third instruction any sooner, because uh, or no matter what the dependencies were. And so in general, we're going to want that uh, to be the case, where we want instructions to be waiting on the pipeline rather than on dependencies. So that means in the first picture, there's this uh, there's this stall of one clock cycle, and we're going to want to eliminate these kinds of stalls. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use these static profiling tools to figure out where stalls happen. Now, the first thing we're going to do, uh, the first thing that we have to do is generate the assembly and the instruction schedule that goes with it. And so you can use GCC dash big S and the same flag works with XLC to generate the assembly. And then we have this utility that we have this utility called SPU timing, which runs on the cell and which will tell you the instruction schedule. Basically, it'll take in your assembly file and tell you exactly when each instruction in that assembly gets scheduled. Uh, if you call it with dash running count, then it will tell you the running count of uh, clock cycles at each stage, which means if you look at the last number, that will tell you 
kind of how long your program took to run in clock cycles. And we'll write the output to uh, a file of the same name as the input, but with dot timing at the end. Uh, now, if you're using our make file, you can actually do all this, the uh, generate the assembly and the timing info all in one step by doing spu timing equals one and then make the name of the dot s file. All right? Now, if you'll recall on cell, we're going to have only in order execution. The, the, ex the instructions are just going to execute in the order that they're specified in the assembly. In the assembly. And, uh, and the because the cell has uh, dual pipelines, that means there's two pipelines in which instructions can go. And the, in the pipelines are going to be selected just based on the instruction type. And of course, two instructions are only going to go in simultaneously when the dependencies allow it. Uh, right. So if you're looking at the assembly, uh, you're going to see lots of lines of this form, uh, op, destination, and then the source uh, registers. So when you're trying to figure out dependencies, uh, it's going to be helpful to be able to look at each line of the assembly and figure out uh, what registers that line is reading from and what registers that line is writing to. And there's also information in the assembly file. I, s I went into that last time which tells you kind of for each chunk of assembly what the corresponding source what the corresponding source file line is. All right. And the the actual output of the static profiler, like I said, it will spit out a schedule of uh, when each instruction runs. And and in this schedule you're, you're going to see uh, one digit for each cycle that the instruction is running. So however many digits there are, that's how many cycles are being used. And in front of, in front of some of the instructions, you're, you're going to see these dashes, which represent stalls. So these three dashes in front of uh, this instruction, FM, means that, uh, means that based on the pipeline, you could have scheduled this instruction up here right after uh, the previous, previous instruction finished. However, because you're waiting on particular dependencies, you're only going to be able to schedule it uh, these three cycles later. So that, that's a three cycle stall. Um, and uh, this static profiler output is also going to show kind of other information. The original assembly appears on the right hand side. And which pipeline the instructions are going into is going to show up on the left. Any questions about this uh, format? Dual issue just means that these instructions are going to be executed at the same time. Pardon? Uh, over here? Yeah. All right, so these are the arguments to the assembly instructions. So remember, the first one is going to be the destination register, and the, the other ones are going to be all the source registers that that instruction is going to use. All right. So again, we, we want to be able to reorder these instructions to minimize stalls. And what you're going to do is you're going to try and look for instructions that are going to take a long time. Potentially, for example, loads and floating point instructions are going to take a long time. And, and if these instructions have dependencies, then those dependencies are going to stall. So not only do you want to minimize stalls, you, want to, uh, you also want to dual issue instructions whenever possible, although that's a little bit more difficult to just kind of eyeball. But anyway, if you get up to an ideal the, the ideal uh, running point where you're able to dual issue every instruction, then that means you're going to be running two instructions per cycle, or it's going to take one half cycle per instruction. Anyway, going through the, these assembly files and you know figuring out where the dependencies are, which instructions you can move around, it's kind of tedious, and you're not going to be able to apply these techniques to your entire program. So if you only have you know, limited time, what you're going to have to do is try these on you know, the most critical code first. And that's usually going to be uh, loop bodies, because those are going to get executed many, many times. And any savings that you see there will be multiplied many, many times over. 
So I'm going to go through an example of one possible optimization you could do. So, uh, so we'll actually go through these, these same files in, uh, in the exercise about you know, two minutes from now. Uh, this is from lab one. And this is one of the, this is one of the code snippets or the assembly snippets from the uh, SPU program. So notice that over here we have these uh, load instructions followed by a, I guess this is a shift instruction. And, and there's uh, two kind of pairs of these. And in each one, the shift instruction is going to depend on the result of the previous load. Does everyone see that from the arguments? So, so now the problem is that because this shift is happening right after the load, it's going to stall for a long time because uh, the load takes uh, six cycles. All right, so what can we do over here in order to reduce stalling? Yeah, we can do the loads concurrently. And in general, we just want to move these loads up as high as we can. So if I move, if I move these, the two loads up to the top of this, oops, the top of this uh, snippet, then we have uh, two loads followed by all the instructions that came after. Now the first shift is going to stall by only two cycles. And the second shift is not going to stall at all. All right? Uh, so, pardon? Uh, so the question is, what would this change look like in code? Uh, the thing is that kind of the order of these generated instructions is going to be dependent on the compiler. And it's really up to the compiler how it wants to order these instructions. So this change is not going to be reflected in like your C code. Uh, and that's why you have to do these optimizations after the assembly is generated. Does that make sense? Um, if you have a smart compiler, then it might do some, some kind of instruction scheduling in order to minimize stalls using kind of this methodology. Yep. So I was quite, quite impressed with XLC. I compiled the same little program under um, GCC or SPU with, the op with optimization level three and under XLC. XLC was, ran one, uh, one ran in half the time. So it was doing a much better job of instruction scheduling than GCC. Than GCC. Um, so that's uh, okay. something, if, if, you're, if you've got your a choice and the XLC compiler is working for you, yeah. yeah. might be it, a thing to use. It, in general, uh, this kind of sort of low level assembly hacking for instruction reordering is not something you'll do uh, just because compilers are getting incredibly good at uh, doing instruction scheduling. Uh, but here, the exercise is for you to sort of get familiar with the tools and understand uh, a little bit more in detail as to what's going on at the instruction level. Uh, in the cell pipeline. Uh, another thing to note here is, uh, well, two things you can consider here. How high up can you push the loads? And why does the first, and related to that is, why can't you completely hide the uh, latency for the first load, and hence the first shift still takes two cycles to stall? Um, so that's dependent on you know, how much slack do you have in your schedule, dependent on dependencies and you know, where the loop starts. Uh, so in some cases, you simply can't hide entire latency. Um, so you, you know, it's part of considerations you have, to, you have to consider. But heuristics in the compilers are getting really good at it. And uh, in case you're wondering, I think this code was compiled using XLC on no optimizations, which is why there's you know, this really easy opportunity for optimization here. And it turns out if we run the, the uh, timing utility again, we saved uh, eight cycles. So notice that on the previous picture, we're going up to seven in that column. And now we're only going up to the previous nine. All right? So what we're going to do for the exercise right now is uh, you're gonna, you can try something like this. What we're going to try and do is just improve performance by rescheduling instructions. And so if you, if you uh, download the tarball, you'll get the exact same file I was working on before. And what we're going to have you do is just generate the assembly, practice generating the assembly, modifying it, and then continuing with the rest of the build process to get a, a new object file that's based on your modified assembly.
All right, any questions? Now you're, you're just need to, you just need to find, you know, for example, one opportunity for optimization. And you can do the exact same thing that I did if you want. And uh, so the key is just after you've done your reordering, you want to rerun the timing utility to see how many cycles you saved. Also, you want to, of course, continue the build process to get the final uh, executable file. And you want to run that to make sure that your code is still correct. Uh, uh, Okay, so this, this uh, static profiling process does have its limitations. The first is that, uh, and this is a pretty major limitation, the, the static profiler assumes that none of the branches are taken. So it basically just zips through, zips through the entire assembly file in a straight line. So that means you're gonna have a skewed view of how long, uh, how long code inside conditionals or loop bodies is gonna take. Because conditionals, if there's savings in there, they may not uh, they may not run at all, and loop bodies, any savings in there may get, uh, may get multiplied many, many times. So if, for example, you see that you've saved eight cycles in the static schedule, you're going to need to know kind of some more context. That is, you know, whether it's inside a loop body and how many times you expect that to run. So you're going to need a little more information to get a good idea of how these instruction reorderings are actually affecting the runtime of your program. And also because this is static profiling, which means you're not using an actual program run to, to get data, you're not going to get kind of behavior, you're not going to capture any behavior that depends on the inputs to your program. So for example, uh, you don't get any, uh, you don't get counts of how many times each loop runs or you know, when each branch is taken. Uh, one other thing to worry about, uh, which isn't going to be manifested in, the, in these uh, static 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 profiling pr uh, predictions is uh, branch prediction. Now remember, the static profiler is just going to ignore all branches. And the thing is that branch prediction, uh, because a branch prediction is used to reduce the stall after a branch is taken by kind of prefetching instructions and possibly doing other things. So what it will do is guess the direction that the branch will take, and then it will start prefetching instructions from the expected place where it's, it's going to resume after the branch. And the thing is, if your branch prediction is wrong, then you're going to incur a pretty large penalty. And the penalty is on the order of 20 cycles while, it's, while it flushes the pipeline and starts fetching instructions from the new place. Uh, on the other hand, if branch prediction is, uh, is correct, then there's uh, no penalty at all, actually. So the next instruction will just resume you know, right after uh, right after the branch. Anyway, anyway, you can give hints to the compiler to tell it what you think the outcomes of branches will be. And this can, this can help in some circumstances. Uh, basically, there are these, there are these uh, macros that you can define. And uh, what you're going to use is this uh, built-in expect, 
compiler intrinsic. And what that means is uh, if you put that inside an if, it will mean, you know, uh, run the if as if the condition were exp, but then I'm going to expect that the value of this uh, condition is going to be, for example, true or false. All right, does that make sense? Uh, anyway, uh, just one note about the exercise that you did. I believe the original, uh, the original runtime was 469 clock cycles. Actually, if you run XLC with 05 optimizations, it will reduce that to 188. So almost uh, 280 cycles of savings. All right. So uh, we'll, pardon? Uh, no, so the original code was, uh, the original assembly was compiled on O0, or no optimizations. But then, uh, you know, if you're, if you're doing an optimization by hand that saves eight cycles off of O0, these are actually pretty easy to find. And the uh, O5 optimization level will actually shave off, you know, 280 cycles. So uh, we'll break for about 10 minutes, and then after the break, we'll do uh, uh, SIMD on cell. All right?